In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good morning. It's good to see y'all this morning, and you know it's better than good. It's so good. So good. Oh my goodness, and all of you who are worshiping online with us in the online balcony, we see you too, and we're glad that you are here. It's good to be together. So uh, just this past week, I heard a true story about another pastor who became sort of a local legend in Jackson, Mississippi because of what he did one Easter morning. It was your typical Easter service. The music was good, and the kids were squirming, and the pews were packed, and the place was full. But when it came time for this pastor to preach his Easter sermon, he did the unthinkable He stood up, walked into the pulpit, leaned straight into the microphone, and said just three words. He said, it's all true. And then he sat down. It's all true. Now, as you can imagine, in the aftermath, there were two very different kinds of reactions to this that got talked about kind of all over town for a few weeks. There were those who called him lazy and said (laughs) that, and can I just say, he got it down to three, but I've got it down to two, so good. (laughs) (laughs) So there were those who called him lazy and said that on such an important day with so much pageantry and so many guests, he should have done his job and tried harder. But then there were others. There were those who were just mystified that someone would actually dare to let the gospel speak for itself with such brave clarity and simplicity and truth. Because y'all, what else is there for us to say on Easter morning? I struggle with it myself every single Easter. I think in some ways it's the hardest day to preach. What else is there to say except, no really y'all, we actually believe this. It is good news and it's all for you and it's all true. In some ways, I think this is part of what's going on in the story that we just heard from the gospel. We catch up with two disciples. It's still Sunday. It is Easter Sunday in that story, but nobody really understands what's going on. And so we catch up with these two disciples who, has, who had been apparently on Team Jesus for kind of a while, but they thought he was a prophet mighty in word and deed. They thought that he was the one who was going to bring change to Israel and to their lives and to the world. They thought all of that, but instead, he just got himself killed. It's been three days. So you can imagine how they feel at this time. And yes, earlier in that day, there had been whispers and rumors that maybe he wasn't dead after all, but who in their right mind could ever believe such a thing? And so they did what probably many of us would have done. They packed up all their doubts and despair and uncertainties and fear, and they left town, and they made the seven-mile trek to the next town over, seven whole miles. When was the last time any of y'all walked seven miles? It's been a long time since I've done that, and by a long time, I'm pretty sure I mean never. (laughs) It's a long trek that they're going on, And so while it's the next town over, they're trying to get out of Dodge. But while they're on the road, some fella catches up with them and says, Hey guys, why the long face? What's what's the scuttlebutt? They don't know this guy, or at least they don't think they know this guy. But you and I have the benefit of knowing, in the way the story is told, that it's actually Jesus. And so they look at this stranger and they say, Really? Are you the only idiot who doesn't know all that just went down in Jerusalem? And so they tell him about Jesus, and they tell him about the rumors, and they tell him about their doubts and despair, their fears and uncertainty. They're telling it all to Jesus, but because they are so sure that he is dead, they do not, they cannot see who's right in front of them. They do not believe. But as they keep walking, 
Jesus, in his Jesus way, says, Oh, you dummies. Let me tell you something true. And he begins probably the most consequential Bible study in all of Scripture. He starts talking them through the Scriptures and pointing out every instance where it was always clear that this was always the plan, that it was always going to be Jesus, that he was always going to die, that he was always going to be raised, and that it is all true. They had been talking to Jesus about Jesus, and now Jesus is talking about the Bible, talking about Jesus to the friends of Jesus. I mean, you see how Jesus is just all up in the middle of this. And yet they still don't see, and they still don't believe. Finally, after that long seven-mile journey, seven miles, y'all, they get to town, and they beg the stranger to come in and eat with them. And there, weary from the day while evening is at hand, they sit at a table, and this guy takes some bread, and he blesses it, and he breaks it, and he gives it to them. And shazam, which is a theological term. <laughs> Somehow, in the simple setting of that shared meal, their eyes are opened, and they realize who it is they've been talking to this whole time. Y'all, they realize it's all true. The rumors of grace, the whispers of love, the promise of hope, the possibility of forgiveness, it's all true. It's so true, in fact, that they get up immediately after he vanishes from their sight. And have you been paying attention to how long the journey was? How long was the journey that they had just made? <laughs> you got it. They get up right then and there, and they go back the other seven miles through the night to go find the others and to tell them all what they had just seen. It's good news. In fact, it's so good. So good. So the truth is, and here's the thing, I think all of us know a little bit about what it's like to be those two disciples on that road from time to time, maybe a lot of the time. All of us walk this life carrying our own doubts and despair. I cannot tell you how often someone will come and land on the, the couch in my office and sit there and say, I need to tell you, I have certain doubts, I have certain despairs, I have certain fears. Am I still allowed to be here? Am I still allowed to serve? Am I still allowed to love St. John's and the Lord? And oh baby, yes you are, because join the club, that's why we're here. We bring all of that to this place, and we let Jesus love us into something newer and deeper. But it's easy, and you all know this, it's easy for those doubts and despair to get the better of us. It is easy, in fact, to let it, if we're not careful, go toxic and turn into things like anger that we then inflict on others. We see it all the time in our society. We see it on TV. There's a fabulous new TV show on Netflix that's all about this kind of behavior. I will not name it or else you will take it as a recommendation from the rector and you'll know what kind of garbage I watch on TV. <laughs> but I'm just saying it's, it's out there, this, this fear, doubt, self-loathing, despair that we have that turns into anger that we then inflict on others. We see it everywhere. We see it right now in the life of this earth from our leaders at the top down to the loneliest among us at the bottom, from our uncles and our cousins and our co-workers on Facebook, and even from ourselves more than we would like to admit, there are legions who are hell-bent on spreading the gospel of hate and assuring as many people as they can that they are not right, that they are not worthy, that they are not forgiven, that they are not enough, that they are not loved. It is told in pulpits and capitals by preachers and politicians and everyone in between. And let's go ahead and name the truth. It was preached from this pulpit 
for a long season in the life of this church, and we repent of it because that is a lie. It is the greatest lie. It is the lie that Jesus himself came to break and debunk and do away with forever. And so, if you have ever had your own doubts or despairs, if you have ever been told that you are not enough, that you are not lovable or loved, then you, my friend, you have come to the right place today. For here we know of a Jesus who has conquered death and been raised to life again, and not for no reason, but for the very specific reason of telling you once and for all that you are the apple of God's eye, and don't you ever let anyone else tell you any different. I have been told recently that because I talk about Jesus so much and I have a southern accent, that sometimes people stumble into this church and they are afraid that they are going to hear a gospel of hate. Baby child, you are only ever going to hear the gospel of love proclaimed in this here temple. You know why? Because it's all true. This is why, right here in this place every week, we also make our own walk to Emmaus. We do it together. This is why, right here, we too come to this place with our doubts and despair, beat up from everything that the world inflicts upon us, not always sure of what we believe, and we too come here waiting and wanting to hear and see Jesus. And y'all, lucky you, it's exactly how our service is designed. Our service has two parts with a half time in the middle. It's the word and it's the table. We open up the scriptures as we walk down the road together. That's what's happening right this very second. And then after the peace, we go to that table where Christ is made known to us in the breaking of the bread. And it's all true. And it's for you. And it's good news. But it gets even better. Because, see, it carries over. It doesn't just live here in this place. As you've heard me say before, it spills out, it goes, it carries out. And if you doubt that, well, listen to one of your own fellow parishioners. I got to get out a little bit this last week. Sometimes they do let me out. And (laughs) there have been all kinds of wonderful cultural events happening in the great city of Tallahassee this week. And I've been to some concerts and some fun stuff. And I bumped into some of you and sometimes... Uh, One of you, if I bump into you in in public, you'll say, oh, hey, Father Lonnie, you're always surprised to see me in a t-shirt and a hat. I mean, just regular guy, y'all. I don't don't wear this all the time. (laughs) People are surprised to see me, and, and then they say, hey, are you preaching on Sunday? And here's the thing. I like to not tell you whether or not I'm preaching on Sunday because I like to keep you guessing, so get used to that. But uh, one of the things that I will often say when someone asks, are you preaching, is I'll say, oh, no, I, I thought you were. Um, wh- have you not been working on it? What, what you got for us? And I said that to someone along the way, and actually later in the week, they texted me. And they said, so I've been dwelling on the story of the walk to Emmaus. And here's what I think. They said, I think that those two disciples on the road, they lack faith, which means that they lack hope. And this person went on in their text to say, you know, it's, it's only when they put that aside and sit down for the mundane but profound act of sharing a meal that their eyes are opened and they realize the truth that demands to be shared. And then they knock it home. They say, maybe we could stop arguing in our own society and just eat some food and drink a beer and listen to some good music and let Jesus do his work on us. Maybe. You see, there's the potential for what happens here to spill out to out there. Because you see, here's the thing. What is true for you here, forgiveness, gentleness, love, healing, grace, what is true for you here, because it is true for you here, 
means it can be true for others out there. The gospel of love is stronger than the gospel of hate, but it does need those of us who are willing to walk the seven miles to joyfully tell it. So, y'all have heard me say before that you may not know why it is that you came here today, but lucky you, I always know why you came here today. You came here to find out if the rumors of grace and the whispers of love are true. You came here to see if you might encounter Jesus in the opening of Scripture and the breaking of the bread. You, my friends, you came here for the sake of hearing three little words. And I'm sorry that I added a whole bunch around it, but you know, context. You came here to hear these three little words. So hear them and relax and rejoice and go tell them. It's all true. Amen.